Well, good morning. Uh, I'm Riley Walters, Deputy Director of the Japan Chair here at Hudson Institute, and welcome to our event, Re-examining the CPTPP and America's Trade Priorities. We have a great event for you today. Uh, in fact, it's quite a timely event as this month celebrates the three-year anniversary of the implementation of the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, also known as the CPTPP, or TPP-11, or simply just TPP still. <laughs> uh, if you weren't familiar with this mega trade agreement already, or even if you were, uh, it's been making its way in the, in the, into the news recently, uh, the most recent of which is the news that South Korea hopes to apply for the trade agreement soon. This would make it the fourth to apply to join the CPTPP since the agreement's implementation, uh, joining the United Kingdom, People's Republic of China and Taiwan. And despite that the uh, US left the TPP negotiations nearly five years ago, I think this goes to show that there's still at least regional interest in the trade agreement. And so my hopes today uh, for this event is to take another look at the CPTPP uh, from a few different perspectives. For example, uh, how has the CPTPP impacted large advanced economies like Japan? How has it impacted smaller emerging economies like Vietnam? What would joining the trade agreement mean for a place like Taiwan, which has struggled to find trade partners? And because we're in DC, uh, what should US policymakers take away from all of this? Or maybe more importantly, what is the Biden administration's alternative to CPTPP? So today to answer these questions and more, uh, as well as provide their uh, insight into the trade agreement. We have a wonderful panel for you today, uh, and I'll just briefly introduce them, and then we can go straight into the panel discussion. Up first will be Dr. Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman of the Board and President of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Prior to his current role, he was involved in much of the business sector, involving roles at Mitsubishi Corporation. Second will be Dr. Hyun Du, Senior Lecturer in public policy at the Fulbright School of Public Policy and Management at the Fulbright University, Vietnam. Prior to his current role, he worked at the Bank for Investment and Development of Vietnam. Third will be Dr. Roy Chen Lee, Deputy Executive Director of the Taiwan WTO and RTA Center at Chunghua Institute for Economic Research. Prior to that, he was an Associate Research Fellow at CIER. And finally, Charles Freeman, who is Senior Vice President for Asia at the US Chamber of Commerce. Prior to his role, he served a variety of roles throughout government, business, and academia. The way that this will work is each speaker will give about 10 minutes of remarks, after which I might ask a question or two. Uh, and so with that, the floor is yours, Akimoto-san. Well, good morning. Thank you for your kind introduction, Riley. I'm delighted to be here. I'm also honored to be with the distinguished fellow panelists. Looking forward to discussion. My task today is to talk about CPTPP from Japan's viewpoint, three years after it went into force. I have three ma major points. Number one, Japan's leadership role in the region. Number two, opportunity and the challenges for Japan and CPTPP. Number three, change nature of uh, CPTPP and new goals from the viewpoint mainly from Japan. First, CPTPP is significant to Japan. It is very important for Japan in terms of Japan's role in the international community and perception of Japan by major countries in the region. Looking back, it was a kind of mini miracle that Japan found itself in a position where Japan could, could play a critical role in making CPTPP a reality. The United States initially took lead in expansion negotiation of the original TPP, which was started by Brunei, Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore. It was impossible for Japan to begin expansion negotiation on its own, even if Japan wanted to do so, without the US engagement at the beginning. However, Expansion negotiation took an unexpected course. It faced the danger of a collapse when President Trump, Trump unilaterally decided to withdraw from it, uh, from it immediately after he took office on January 20th, 2017, 
Prime Minister Abe was determined to make most of this unexpected circumstance. At the time, Japan's reputation was that, that Japan would now generally follow the US on the major international issues and may be hesitant to play a major role, particularly in unilateral context. However, contrary to a stereotype, uh, Japan under Prime Minister Abe took initiative to patiently continue to expansion, continue to uh, continue expansion negotiation and eventually bring it to fruition in 2018. CPTPP may be the first major multilateral agreement of this sort, which Japan play a leadership position to make it a reality. It was a pleasant surprise, not only to US trade negotiators who worked on expansion negotiation before the US withdrawal, but uh, uh, also to Japan itself, that Japan could play a, uh, play a significant independent role in the region based on goodwill and a partnership, which Japan has built over the years in the region. It also changed underlying nature of the relationship between the United States and Japan. Japan is not the little brother following the big brother anymore. In other words, CPTPP demonstrated that Japan can play a role of an independent partner to the United States on certain major regional and global issues that are critically important to the both countries. Second, CPTPP without the US presence, uh, without the US, present both major opportunities and challenges to Japan. The biggest opportunity for Japan is further solidify Japan's leadership position and strengthening a major free trade framework in the region. Japan is the biggest economy among CPTPP 11 member countries and expected to uh, respect it now as a mostly a rule-based, fair, politically stable country worthy of being a chair in 2021 and vice chair in 2022. It has a big ch chance for Japan to help shape CPTPP, truly a, a regional free trade platform, benefiting member countries with a regional point of view, while establishing itself as an, un, as an independent major player. However, Japan faces major challenges as well. The biggest challenge, of course, is uh, China's desire to become a member of CPTPP. Kurt Campbell said at the US Institute of Peace last month, China is serious about our entry and began already talking with uh, some of the member countries. In China's mind, it is clear that China should and must write trade rules and the principles in the region, not the United States and, and certainly not Japan. In other words, China's desire to be a member country of CPTPP is a warning against Japan that China will not allow Japan to play a major role in CPTPP in the future to establish trade rules and the principle in the region. Obviously, uh, China faces many technical difficulties in joining CPTPP because of its trade practices and internal economic arrangement. Additionally, country like Australia uh, which has uh, a soured relationship with China uh, and also have a major trade dispute over Bali and wine. Vietnam, which has a historically difficult relationship and territorial dispute with uh, China will not welcome China's entry with op open arms to say the least. However, it is a major challenge for Japan to prevent China's forceful entry to CPTPP without critically damaging relationship with China. There are of course issues of uh, uh, Taiwan, uh, the UK, South Korea, and so on, in terms of possible new members, uh, a membership to CPTPP, which present added layer to the challenge to Japan. Third, Japan's uh, calculus for CPTPP has changed much in the, la uh, in the last three years. As a matter of fact, the strategic nature uh, or concept of CPTPP has greatly changed with the US withdrawal. Two elements are very significant in my mind. First, there's no realistic possibility on the horizon for the United States to re-enter CP CPTPP. Free trade has become an uh, unacceptable word or, or a concept for many Americans, uh, voters and the politicians like. Uh, and, uh, however, reality is that even if the United States want to re-entry 
one re-entry into uh, TPP, it is not automatic. United States has to earn it. It is probably going to require the United States to apply as a new member, just like China, Taiwan, or the UK, and so on. There's no way that the United States will be able to meet these requirements at this particular time because of domestic uh, uh, political landscape. First, President Biden, Biden will, will be consumed with the COVID-19, economic recovery, domestic cultural war, climate change, to name a few, particularly with the midterm coming next year. There is no political will or capital to build a case for CPTPP re-entry in the United, United States at all, regarding, regardless of whether you are Democrats or Republican. So in short, the United States will be out of picture for foreseeable future in terms of multilateral trade agreements in, in general uh, uh, in a meaningful way, and will be uh, unstable in terms of uh, a regional trade arrangement reflecting domestic political situations. Second, the relationship between the United States and China has significantly deteriorated since CPTPP came into fruition. Strategically speaking, it is only natural both the United States and China would like to shape CPTPP to its own liking to help benefit national interest of their, uh, its own. However, from a viewpoint of Japan, it is not desirable to make CPTPP a battlefield or even focal point of intense rivalry, rivalry between US and China, reflecting a delicate uh, position of the Southeast Asian countries as well. It has potential to undermine and uh, in the worst case scenario, destroy CPTPP. Japan's official position may be that the Japan wants the United States to be back in CP CPTPP, but it, it is strategically more realistic and effective that Japan play a leadership position to solidify unity of CPTPP member countries and establish CPTPP as a promoter of high level, fair, and a neutral free trade uh, uh, agreement in the region. In order to achieve this goal, it would be wise for Japan to maintain a high level of free trade standard and to continue to modernize the agreement. And at the same time, to increase a in, uh, number of member, mem members uh, uh, in the region, such as Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines. In conclusion, I'd like to urge our American friends to make free trade part of a political discourse in the United States. People blame President Trump for withdrawing from, the from TPP, and rightly so. But Mrs. Clinton was also against TPP during the campaign. I know it is terribly difficult, maybe impossible, having the midterm coming next November, particularly when the United States has so many other contentious domestic issues that could affect the result of the midterm. However, country like the United States, a leader of the free world, so to speak, must have a stable, sustained stance on the major international agreement and negotiations. Free trade is a big part of the US global strategy and Japan as an ally of the United States would like the United States to have stable, predictable, sustainable engagement with the international community because it is only a matter of the United States credibility and ability to lead in the international community. Thank you. Thank you, Akimoto-san. I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree. I think, you know, Washington for sure needs to take a little bit more of a leadership role, uh, not just internationally, but domestically to remind folks that there is a benefit to trade. Um, and that's not just a message for the administration, that's a message for Congress, which also tends to have a say in these things. <laughs> I wanted to ask a quick question. Since, since Japan is sort of seen now as the leader of CPTPP in a way, um, you know, it wasn't the only mega trade agreement to have come to fruition over the last few years. In fact, the, the Regional and Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, this is basically a, a, basically a deal between China and Japan, as well as including ASEAN members, uh, goes into force next month. Uh, I don't know if you've, uh, if you can maybe perhaps talk about the differences between the two, but uh, you know, it, 
going to your remarks, I think what others have said, uh, you know, the view is that China is going to have a, a tough time, if even any chance at all, getting into the CPTPP. But there's also this other trade agreement that exists. How do these two differ? Uh, and again, what, what role does Japan have to play in all of this? First of all, uh, with regard to uh, uh, China's entry to TPP, I think common sense uh, uh, agreement is that the China will have a, a hard time uh, uh, getting into TPP because of uh, uh, internal uh, domestic economic arrangement uh, and the trade uh, uh, practices, uh, data transfer uh, restriction, uh, uh, you know, support for uh, uh, state-owned uh, uh, companies, and so on and so forth. However, uh, um, uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, take it lightly because uh, uh, China is, uh, um, from what I understand, uh, is serious about uh, becoming a member. And the uh, United States doesn't really have a vote except uh, uh, this uh, poison pill uh, that the United States have with uh, uh, Canada and Mexico. Uh, and uh, uh, United, uh, according to uh, Kirk Campbell, as I said, you know, uh, uh, China has already uh, started to have a, a preliminary negotiation with uh, 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 member countries. So I wouldn't take it uh, uh, lightly. Uh, CPTPP, uh, sorry, uh, uh, RCEP uh, is uh, 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 compared to uh, a TPP, uh, relatively uh, uh, light uh, uh, trade agreement and uh, uh, much more open uh, 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 because of uh, 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 that uh, uh, lightness. And uh, I think uh, uh, Japan see it, see it as a, a good uh, 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 platform uh, to bring uh, 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 countries uh, uh, that may not share the high standard of uh, uh, TPP, but uh, uh, come to the same table and uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, trade issues. Uh, with regard to uh, uh, ASEAN members in uh, uh, TPP, uh, you don't have, uh, uh, or we don't have, uh, uh, for example, Cambodia and Laos, countries that have a, a close relationship with uh, uh, China. And I think uh, uh, RCEP can play an a important role in bringing in uh, countries that may not be part of a, a, a TPP in the near future. So it's almost like the, there are de definitely different standards. CPTPP is a little bit more higher standard. It's a little bit more uh, harder to get into. The barriers are a little bit higher. The standards are higher. And so RCEP, the standards are a little bit lower, which might be easier for some countries, some smaller countries, still emerging economies to accept. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, up next, we're going to have uh, Dr. Du talk about Vietnam's experience with CPTPP. Dr. Du, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this event. I think it's a great honor for me. Um, I would like to talk about uh, four points. Uh, the first one I talk about the Vietnam eagerness in joining uh, the chess agreements around the world. The second one, I um, want to talk about Vietnam's implementation of the agreement in CBTPP. And we look at the results after three years and then looking forward. So if uh, it's interesting to look in Vietnam that you know that Vietnam have been very eager in joining trade agreement. And we have trade agreement with more country around the world. We have the trade agreement with the US, with Europe, with South Korea and many other countries. Um, and Vietnam also uh, joined uh, WTO and other multinational agreements where Vietnam joined ASEAN and with other country. So, and then it, it, the result is really interesting that um, if we compare the Vietnam positions and the GB per capita, it means that the development, the development level, it any other in Vietnam very low. But in terms of check to the GDP ratio, Vietnam is among the most open country around the world. And Vietnam, you can, it is quite interesting that Vietnam can compare with Singapore and Malaysia in terms of openness. If we add import and import and compare to GDP, right now Vietnam over 200%. It is really high. So that is, it, it, it means that the trade agreements or openness at, at Vietnam have been a lot of benefit for Vietnam. So that is um, 
very good boy. And then in, in this case, so if we look at how Vietnam in, have been implemented the uh, uh, agreement in CB, TPP, so you see Vietnam have, create, uh, have created mutual benefits in trade exchange with other countries, especially for uh, the country in CB, TPP. And in this case, I think the Vietnam the government have very clear plans to implement the agreement in CBTPP. For example, the ministries at the central level, they have plans. So this afternoon, my friend from the Ministry of Chat, he sent me some reports because I asked him, I think he sent me some reports about how his ministry to direct the local government to implement the chat agreement. So it means that Vietnam have plan yeah, to encourage some time to direct the local government to implement uh, the agreement in the CBTPP. And it's interesting, it's interesting that I think there are no major issues between Vietnam and other countries or other partners in the CBTPP agreement. So, but if we look at the one thing that is the result, after three years, it's quite limited. So in this case, uh, we look at the situation and the add up um, uh, of the export to uh, the CBTPP countries, it just account for about 14% of total export in 2021. So the trust surplus in 2019 or 2020, just over 1% of the total trust. So you see it's quite balanced. And in this year, basically, it it balanced. After ten months, the surplus is only uh, sixty eight million dollar. It's quite small. And Japan, it, uh, our college just speak, uh, it is the biggest trade partner in the CBTPP. This year, it account about fifty percent, and for the rest, it only fifty percent. So we see some kind of imbalance in uh, only in CBTPP. And but for 10 country is only 15%. It's much lower than US and China because the, the share of the total export in Vietnam to those country is very uh, big. So this is um, one interesting thing that uh, I, uh, I think we don't expect it, that it, the trade increase, uh, or trade growth between Vietnam and the CBTVB members is lower with other partners, such as the United States, and Europe. So as the result that the share of export to um, CBTPP country had decreased from over 15% three years ago. Right now only 14%. Uh, so that in this case, we can look at some limitation of the CBTPP. So without the uh, uh, biggest uh, um, country around the world, especially um, the, the US. So we know that the result have not been expected at the US, United States have withdrew from the CBTPP. So when we um, uh, go, we look to, go looking for work, I think there are some interesting issues that um, we know that I think CBTPP will be more active and important when the big trade partner tries um, go, go, go to go this work or this agreement. So, and we know that I think this is the new or the modern trade agreement. So that is the CBTPP played the roles beyond the traditional of trust in for the traditional one. Um, yeah, it just talk about um, uh, trust, import, import, and some kind of uh, investment. But it's a much broader picture. So in this case, even though I think uh, some kind of competition between the US and China. So maybe when both countries they try to the group, the situation should be interesting, or uh, even the one of them try to group. So we, we think that the dynamism of the trade agreement, it really it keep changing. And in this case, I think the interesting question is how CBTPP would look like if both the United States and China try us, try it. So if you, we see that I think the biggest and the second biggest um, uh, uh, economy try to the, the group, I think it should be very big and very powerful. 
so but we know that at um, uh, our college church, the top before that thing in this case how this settlement would look like in the context of the competition or the confrontation between the US and China is quite obvious. Yes, how if in this case, so especially I think right now, the, the no country have not joined yet. So what would happen? Or uh, what about the roles of the current members? When I talk, if I talk about the roles of Vietnam, so in this big settlement, so because right now I think if we look at other agreements, either I think uh, it usually that US left the, the, the group, but in this case, uh, US withdraw, and then no China and no US, and how it look like. I think that in if we look at the situation of Vietnam now, Vietnam in the very strategic position now. So I I recall my that I think we have an, a quite similar discussion three years ago in the U.S. embassy in, in Japan, talking about the situation in the U.S. And after three years, the trend is more obvious, especially in the um, competition between the U.S. and China. And we have the CPTPP um, now. I think it's interesting that at that time we expected that maybe. You add good um, uh, submit the, the application to join first, but right now China go ahead. So what going on with um, uh, um, uh, this agreement? So it uh, uh, interesting to um, uh, look forward. So that is some point I would like to share um, uh, um, uh, with you today. Well, thanks uh, for your remarks it i think you're absolutely right um in that it, it it's it's interesting actually uh sort of talking about vietnam's role in all of this you know it, it, as you were saying you know the, the the importance of trade for vietnam and uh how cpp how cptpp has sort of helped a little bit of this but of course you you are missing two of your biggest trading partners uh the united states and china in this deal <laughs> but then again you know china has applied uh, as well as uh taiwan and south korea to your other largest trading partners or vietnam's uh largest trading partners even though i i think you mentioned it already i think there's already a trade agreement between the vietnam uh vietnam and south korea um uh, but yeah this is it is interesting how this all sort of plays out in the context of u.s china competition um you know, I, I think, you know, the, the Biden administration has been well and sort of alleviating, alleviating some of the conflicts that it created, um, that the Trump administration created uh, with Vietnam um, uh, in, in context of this, of this US-China competition. Um, so where exactly do you think you see uh, Vietnam's sort of role going forward? You know, I think there's a lot of interest in, the development, the future of, of Vietnam's economy, where it's it, it, where it's sort of heading, its place as more of a, a manufacturer or even a substitute for China um, in, in many of these advanced fields. And so how can sort of it, it, it is there a role, I think, for Ch Vietnam to sort of play um, in sort of the future of, of these issues? Uh, thank you for your questions. I think the first one, I think we look at the it's more interesting that right now China and Taiwan apply at the same time. So China follow the one country policy. So in this case, if China and Taiwan would be two members of the group. So how would it look like? So it is really, it is really interesting. So in this case, how, whether I think either, I think the status of China up and Taiwan they would be to do some kind of economies, or even though some kind of nation are similar because it is very new settlement. So that the one thing that it means that the current members of CBTPP would have some voice and something about that. They talk about that, it's really interesting, right? So in this case, I think that Vietnam would have the quite interesting position. And in dealing with this situation that if we accept that both China and Taiwan become the members, 
how it would look like. So that is one thing I think it is we, we can, uh, can observe I think, in any very near future when CBTPP members gather together and to discuss about those things. The second one, I think, is the US choice. So we got the, the position of Vietnam, not only in CBTPP, but in the strategic position right now. It is really important. So Vietnam follows some guy up the balance in relation between the US and China. So maybe CBTPP should be a good platform yeah, to show that I think intention of uh, Vietnam uh, strategic approach. Well, thanks again for your comments. Speaking of Taiwan, <laughs> up next we have Dr. Lee who can uh, hopefully shed some light on their application process and the importance uh, for Taiwan to join the CPTPP. Uh, Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Riley, and thank you very much for uh, the Hardison Institute to invite me to uh, join this virtual event to discuss this very probably critically important issue for Taiwan. Uh, let me start with uh, the importance of CPTPP for Taiwan. If we look at the trade numbers, uh, the current 11 members uh, trade accounts for about a quarter, about 25% of Taiwan's export. Well, total trade, that, that means also include uh, import. And also uh, it accounts for roughly the same level of uh, inbound and outbound investment. So the 11 members are actually key trading and economic partners of Taiwan. But right now we are doing trade and also investment as a WTO member because there's no uh, FCA or other free trade arrangements between Taiwan and the 11 current members except New Zealand and Singapore. As a matter of fact, uh, Taiwan's FTA with New Zealand and Singapore are the, the only two meaningful FTAs that Taiwan is uh, having. Uh, we have a number of FTAs uh, with our uh, diplomatic partners, but our trade with those countries are extremely small, less than 1% in total. You know, so that's what I'm saying. We have only two meaningful FTAs. Um, that puts Taiwan's export in a, in a um, um, significantly disadvantaged position because uh, by, let, let's come back to CBTPP, about 40%, 40 to 45% of Taiwan's ex export to the CPTPP 11 members, members are subject to various level of tariffs. Let me take, for example, uh, machineries as the, as the example. Our machinery export to uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, and other CPTP, especially South ASEAN CPTP members, are still subject to a tar tariff rate uh, ranging from 5% to 12%. Well, um, and uh, at the same time, most of our competitors, especially uh, South Korea, Japan, China, enjoy in, in many cases zero tariff preferential treatment because either under the umbrella of the CPTPP or bilateral FTAs and soon come into light the RCEP. So this discriminatory treatment that Taiwan's export are facing is actually one of the most important economic rationale for Taiwan to put all the efforts to apply and ensure our participation in the CPTPP. Um, um, so so I, I, I'll describe the importance of, of uh, joining the CPT before Taiwan as not only not as a value added effort, but rather as a kind of catching up effort. A catching up effort to, to compensate or to mitigate this lagging behind, I mean, FTA lagging behind problem that Taiwan is facing in the last decade, right? Uh, at this moment, there's no uh, uh, other uh, uh, viable options available to Taiwan. At bilateral levels, it is politically difficult for all trading partners to engage with Taiwan because of uh, China's opposition. And RCP is no option for Taiwan either because Ta China is already a member of RCEP. And uh, you know, China, China has made that clear in the last 70 years that they oppose any Taiwan's engagement 
in any organization that involve governments of other countries, right? So ASAP is an option, FTA is extremely difficult. Uh, in, in the last 22 decades, experience already proved that. So CPTP becomes probably the only possible option left for Taiwan, right? Now we're already seeing welcome message from Japan and, and, and maybe some of the uh, um, leaders from Australia. And, and that's uh, probably one of the good signs for Taiwan to pull the old efforts here. Now, um, you know, the CPTP is more than trade. As we see it, CPTP also provides uh, a very important uh, in external impetus for Taiwan to accelerate our domestic reforms. For example, uh, CPTPP uh, uh, provisions on a science-based risk assessment scheme is critically important for Taiwan as we are having problems of risk assessments with many other countries. So the introduction of a science-based risk assessment uh, program is, 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 is not only benefiting other CPD members, members, but also actually creating, I mean, modernizing uh, Taiwan's system. And also uh, CBTPP's uh, rules on uh, regulatory transparency is also equally important. So while well, Taiwan's are, are, all, are also pushing these reforms domestically, but I think CBT accelerate the speed of reform. And that's critically important. The last one is CPTP uh, is actually uh, serving increasingly an important role of a platform for policy coordination. You know, uh, all the countries, including uh, US and China, are facing the pressure of uh, supply chain uh, structural reform, right? Uh, the reform, the pressure comes from the consideration of resilience and also the consideration of, for example, economic security and other uh, new policy orientations. And CPTB as, as an economic or trading block, it serves as a platform for for, for uh, information exchange and also policy coordination among TP, CPTV members. And that's actually, uh, I mean, equally important uh, uh, function of the CPTPV in light of all these uncertainties associated with the global supply chain reform agenda. Right. So that's the three, uh, probably the most important uh, factors why Taiwan is, you know, uh, looking for very much uh, for a TPC, potential CPTPP membership. And also for, uh, for Taiwan, uh, we believe that we also bring value to current existing CPTPP members. For example, uh, my, my center works closely with the Taiwanese government on the preparation of the CPTPP application. So I, I, I say this with confidence that I think at least in terms of trade disciplines and, and trade rules, I think Taiwan is almost ready. To, to, to engage in negotiations, right? So uh, I would say uh, the negotiation for Taiwan's accession will be a kind of low hanging fruit. It will be short, quick uh, process. And also uh, I think uh, for Taiwan to participate in the CPTV also uh, bring in a kind of missing piece for the CPTV members, given the fact that Taiwan's uh, role in the global supply chain especially relating to semiconductors and, and ICT sectors, uh, which have been uh, amplified in, in, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Taiwan's participation in the CBD actually increased the level of completeness of the CBDBB as a, as, a, as a trading block or as a group that uh, is, 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 is becoming a, 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 a global supply chain uh, 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 centerpiece. And also, I think Taiwan is, by all, most criteria, a like minded and trusted partners for all current 11 members. Right. So, by joining CBTV, I think you also create additional values, not only for uh, Taiwan, but also uh, 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 create additional values for all existing members. Uh, they, they, will, they will be thrown in issues. For example, Taiwan's uh, uh, agriculture ban on Japanese food, uh, Japanese agricultural product is, is critically important. I mean, politically sensitive here, but science, science scientifically groundless, I have to say this. No, I disagree totally with our restriction, but that require a political ambition to, to, to address the issue. I think 
Taiwan's membership uh, accession is actually the starting point to create another external pressure for Taiwan to address all these uh, uh, technically uh, easy but politically difficult uh, topic. We would like to address that issue and CBTV provides the opportunity. So I think that's that's also uh, important. Lastly, I would like to uh, uh, touch upon lightly, uh, briefly on China's session. If you look at the numbers, you should, every, every all country, including Taiwan, should welcome China, right? Because China is the number one trading partner for, for everybody, uh, almost everybody. But, but I think we need to have a strategic perspective to look at the objective intention and impact of China's accession. As uh, 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 Akimoto san already uh, mentioned, I mean, uh, China's uh, application from our perspective uh, is mixed with a lot of uh, political agendas, right? Uh, you know, by all standards, uh, we are not seeing China preparing to uh, bring all its regulatory regimes to meet the requirements of the CPTPP. Let me take internet governance as, as an example. China sees that as a kind of digital sovereignty rather than the economic regulatory regime, right? So it cannot, I cannot, I mean, currently there's no evidence to demonstrate that China is willing to compromise its digital uh, sovereignty just to meet the standard of the CPTPP. It's just, it doesn't just match the two values, right? So if that's the case, then what is the objective of China's application? That's, that's, that will be a very interesting and probably uh, a, a question that require a much broader strategic uh, examination of, of, of the, uh, the project. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking not only from uh, Taiwan's perspective. I think that's probably a regional issue for everybody to uh, consider. Finally, uh, we still need support from not only uh, Japan and Vietnam, but also Australia, Canada, and Malaysia for to for Taiwan to join. Uh, I think uh, the intention of South Korea to become also a member actually uh, is a kind of facilitating factor for Taiwan. We would like to see more countries join their interest uh, to join uh, the CPTP, and that kind of dilutes the political sensitivity of you know Taiwan China jointly applying. So that we can be considered as a group applying for the CPTPP uh, at the same time. And probably that's um, a good news for Taiwan. So next year, we'd like to see, for example, Thailand and other countries also show their interest and, and, and officially file their application. That's probably a good thing for Taiwan as well. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, if we talk as much about the benefits of countries joining the CPTPP, but there's also a lot of concern, right? When it, when we talk about China joining and sort of the lip service that they've, they're sort of, you know, the rhetoric about how they're willing to accept some of these standards, which is highly questionable. I think another good point that you've made is that, you know, Taiwan, I think for a long time, has been losing out because it, it doesn't it, it hasn't been you know at the same treated the same way as it's as a standard economy when trying to make these trade deals and so you know we talk about building supply chain resilience uh, and we talk about the threat to Taiwan and its economy in the region well what are we doing about it the United States doesn't have a free trade agreement with Taiwan either which for you know it's I think is long overdue um, anyways uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to head on to our last speaker, Charles Freeman. Uh, Mr. Freeman, the floor is yours. Uh, why don't you bring us home? Thanks. Well, uh, thank you so much, Riley, and it's um, it's an honor to be on this uh, this tremendous panel. Um, let me just uh, make a couple of points, if I can. Um, we'll talk about the, you know ultimately uh, how the United States returns to uh, TPP or CPTPP in, in some form. But I, I want to start by talking about the evolution of trade politics or ad, political attitudes towards trade in Washington, maybe talk about the current trade debate, and then finally talk about that, the pathway forward. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the fact that the um, United States pulled out of TPP was uh, shocking, but perhaps not surprising. Um, the, the United States has long had that tension between 
the strategic or the economic or strategic ambitions you know that come out of the post Second World War period of Bretton Woods when when you know fueled by uh, uh, you know the classical economic liberalism perspective that um, you know the the best way for uh, countries to not go at war would be to trade effectively and trading effectively would would require that uh, the market fundamentals be placed over the, the ability of governments to intervene and interfere with uh, with economic activity between between economies and and you know that that ambition has not that economic ambition has, has frequently not been matched by our political ambition. In fact, if you look back to the Bretton Woods period, the, the international trade organization that was supposed to be created as a result of, of the, the negotiations there, the United States did not end up joining the international trade organization. So it, it, it collapsed of its own weight. Uh, so by, you know, I'll, I'll tell a story um, just to, to illustrate some of the, the the politics of trade that we face here in DC. When I was um, in government at, at USTR, uh, uh, I was working in, uh, as the China, uh, uh, the head of the China office there. And by about uh, 2004, 2005, um, after China had been in the WTO for about three, four years, um, the, the US manufacturing employment was shrinking rather rapidly. And the, the, the question was, all right, isn't and the, 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 uh, the criticism from, particularly from the left, but, but also from the right, was that uh, the China's, the, the role of China in international trade was inherently unfair. And that was the reason for our loss of manufacturing jobs. So at, at you know, being a, a a thoughtful person, I thought. I, I looked at the 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 trade that we were uh, we were actually um, engaged in with China, and it was pretty clear that to me that um, the the that the China China trade factor was not the big factor in manufacturing job losses. For one, economic dynamism as a result of 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 liberalism, economic liberalism, means there's a churn in the labor market. And, and second of all, we were experiencing a significant um, recession uh, at the time. So, so the China factor um, was, at, at, was, I thought, fairly, fairly minimal. So anyway, I, I uh, negotiated with the US International Trade Commission to prepare a study of the, of the job impacts of trade with China since, uh, since WTO accession. And I, I had this ready to go, and uh, I drafted a press release, and it went through the the White House process, and I got called in to uh, to a high level political um, appointee's office in the White House in the West Wing, and was asked to explain what I was trying to do, and I said I'm trying to prove that the president's trade policies with respect to China are not the cause of manufacturing, are not the root cause of manufacturing job losses. And the response was, well, so you're saying it's not China's fault, it's our fault. So pretty quickly the, 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 the study was, was, was shelled. And it's that, it's that kind of, of, of challenge that, that permeates US political attitudes towards trade in that, you know, it's, it is, a convenient target for a lot of the ills that um, are, are the result of, of a market system. And brings us to, to current attitudes towards, uh, towards uh, trade in Washington, where there is an ongoing debate between progressives and, and more kind of classical uh, um, economic types in the administration, where there is, a, there is a requirement for Catherine Tai, the US trade representative, to um, not just address issues of, of traditional trade policy, but also deal with the role of, of, of equity, um, inclusion, and you know, as well as the uh, issues of labor 
and environmental um, uh, potential abuse in trade agreements. That's an enormous agenda, social agenda to, to load onto a trade policy negotiation. And I, I would venture to say it, it, is, it is very likely impossible that uh, uh, Ambassador Ties, I think very well-meaning uh, effort to try to find a common ground between the left and the right with respect to trade. I, I just think it's, um, it, it is uh, tilting at windmills. And, and I, I, if, you, if you look more, um, more closely at some of the, the efforts within the administration to, to expand trade liberalization, particularly if you look at um, Secretary, Commerce Secretary Raimondo's um, goal of the economic framework in the Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific that will be more robust than CPTPP. You know, there's not a whole lot of substance that's uh, clearly um, evident um, in, that, in that framework. And it's far from clear who within the administration is actually working at policies that would achieve that kind of economic framework. And you know, from the business community standpoint, a lot of what um, you would want to see uh, in terms of a robust economic framework was already negotiated and exists in CPTPP. So uh, you know, there's a there is a um, there's a there's certainly a pathway forward uh, within the you know the, the construct of the of the Biden administration's approach. But it, it probably will require a couple of things, um, and and I take uh, with uh, I, I I take notice of uh, comments by other panelists that the United States should would have to apply to rejoin TPP, and it's not a given that we would be welcomed back in. Um, I, I I I feel like if the United States really wanted to get back in, we'd, we'd probably have a relatively uh, smooth reentry. Um, but there are two, two factors. One is, uh, is the desire of the Biden administration to uh, shore up uh, you know, alliances and, and friendships and partnerships, particularly in the Indo-Pacific. And so having an Indo-Pacific strategy that does not have an economic component is recognized by, uh, by the foreign policy and, and the strategic community in Washington, uh, that if you don't have that economic leg of the stool, the stool will topple over and there will but not be a successful Indo-Pacific strategy. So there is that, that, um, that sense of, of pressure uh, to, to come up with something real. And even among, you know, uh, privately, when you talk to very senior level uh, people in the foreign policy and uh, establishment, there's a recognition that, um, uh, Leaving TPP was it was uh, an enormous strategic blunder, and returning to TPP or CPTPP is the fastest way forward to build that third leg of the Indo-Pacific strategic stool, and and so there there is some pressure within the administration to move towards a return to CPTPP, but. Um, you know, with the ongoing debate between the left and the right of the role of trade policy in, in destroying jobs, it, it will certainly take some time. And I agree, certainly we're not going to even begin to address that before the midterms. Uh, finally, the, the China factor. Um, you know, the, the competition with China uh, has, is now in Washington. It's a catalyst or a driver of so much, uh, uh, so much policy, both domestic and international. And uh, the, the concern about China's entry into, uh, into CPTPP uh, is already changing um, hearts and minds about the role of, of the United States versus China in the Indo-Pacific. So you're starting to see um, hawks from the right who, who would otherwise uh, not care about TPP or CPTPP beginning to say, well, we, we, we for competition reasons, uh, we need to get back in. I'm mindful that uh, no one wants to um, use any 
a multilateral agreement or no one from the region wants to use any multilateral uh, agreement to further um, US-China rivalry or global competition, uh, but that's certainly a driving factor in, in US policy towards it. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me just say one final thing. The, the, other, the other piece that's really critical here in terms of US political attitudes is, is the business community has to be the political driver in Washington uh, behind uh, any, any liberalized trade agreement. That's, it's fairly easy for, for businesses to understand and intuit the importance of trade agreements uh, to reduce tariffs. Uh, one can easily calculate the, the, the impact on one's own corporate, uh, corporate revenues of tariffs. But when you start getting into the wonky, more esoteric things that, that we're, we're negotiating in, in agreements like TPP, CPTPP with respect to the role of state-owned enterprises and, and, and the rules, rules of origin, that becomes somewhat more, um, more esoteric and, and less concrete for businesses. Um, I think in 2016, the, the estimate that was that CPTPP or T, the TPP entry would, would, um, would increase US GDP by about 0.5%, 130 plus billion dollars, uh, which you know, is, not a, is not a huge number and, uh, and doesn't move the needle. Um, except that you know it it uh, it did did it add to the the kind of the certainty the 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 institutionalization of classic uh, economic liberal liberal approaches to 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 the market and the role of governments in the region and uh, while you know we we continue to gnash our teeth and pull our hair in Washington and have this debate. Uh, you know, $131 billion probably wouldn't, no one's going to turn that down. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, you talk, you mentioned this, uh, how, you know, within Washington, there's a lot of demand for the Biden administration or just America to be more economically engaged for the Biden team to have this economic component in their strategy in Asia. But that's really not just a, a domestic voice, right? You, we hear that from members of ASEAN, we hear that from our friends in Japan, we hear that from our friends in Taiwan. Uh, it's really unified, I think. And it's it's really onto the Biden administration to lead on this issue because I, I mentioned, and I think as, you know, as we allude to when we talk about midterms next year, there is a congressional role in this as well. And so that's why there's definitely the need for greater leadership. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone uh, and to all of our panelists for joining us today. This has been a wonderful event. Um, Hopefully we can have you all back here soon, if not for another public event, for something a little bit more private. Uh, and I hope you all enjoy your weekend. Happy holidays and take care. Thank you. Thank you.